Today's episode of The Mom Game is brought to you by our friends at Gateway Buick GMC at LBJ and Jupiter. I know that buying a car can be stressful, but not at Gateway because their slogan is, Gateway's got it. And just what does that mean? Well, it means Gateway's got a wide selection of new Buicks, GMCs, and GM-certified used vehicles, all competitively priced. Gateway's got it. In these busy times, you want a car dealer who makes things easy and convenient. Well, guess what? Gateway's got it. When you log on to gatewaybuickgmc.com, look for the Shop, Click, Drive button. This allows you to shop from the comfort of your home, and who doesn't want that? In fact, it's as easy as one, two, three. One, select your vehicle. Two, create your offer. Three, schedule your delivery. And on top of all this, Gateway Buick GMC offers complimentary car washes for life. So when you want a dealer who has it all, Gateways got it. You can find them online at gatewaybuickgmc.com or shop in person at LBJ and Jupiter. GMC, we are professional grade. Experience the new Buick. And welcome to episode 193 of the Mom Game. I'm Emily Jones. She's Julie Dobbs. We are here. We are together. And it is Thanksgiving week. It is. I am grateful for you, Julie Dobbs. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I am. I'm grateful for you. I'm, I'm grateful, grateful for the mom game. For you as well. Grateful Thank for you. the mom game. Yeah. Thankful for World Series title. Still thankful for that. Thankful so for. So thankful. I know. Thankful yeah. For what else? And kids. thankful for a really, yeah, families, all Family. that fun stuff. Uh, and thankful for a really cool guest today, which we're going to get to very shortly. And thankful for a new, not a new sponsor, an old sponsor with kind of a new name, um, which you, you, if you watched After Dark, you would know um, kind of the whole evolution of this. But we have a studio sponsor in 2024. Yes, we This do. is going to be the Francis Coppola Mom Game Studio, or we'll figure out exactly how it's going to go, but we have a, an official studio sponsor, and it is... Francis Coppola Wines. Coppola. Cheers. Cheers. Drinking some. It's delicious. This is oh, what we're this drinking. This is the Diamond Collection. It's mm -hmm. a 2021 Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. it's, I don't like like super buttery Chardonnays mm -hmm. like that are like yellow, mm -hmm. like super yellow. Same. Um, it's this like, is like a really crispy. You experience. call it drier? Is that the uh, right word? Yeah. Because yeah. I think I've discovered that I like dry um, white wines. Yeah, but yeah, this one's good. Yeah, it's good. It's very so. It's tasty. a Chardonnay, but it's not like a heavy Chardonnay. Anyway, they got a little something for everybody, but we're excited to have uh, Coppola being the sponsor of our new home yes. in 2024. And we're going to tell you a little bit about Coppola throughout this holiday season because it is the perfect time for a little bit of vino. Yeah, and if you missed our After Dark, um, make sure and go check that out because. Oh. Francis Coppola brings you all of our, like basically our whole After Dark series. And we love doing those shows because we are just at home and we're drinking. And we also incorporated some early bird gummies into this past one. And we had a lot of fun. Lots so of go fun. check that one out now uh, for the holiday week because we know you got some more time on your hands, right? Go check out our After Dark. And uh, yes, we are so grateful for Francis Coppola's sponsorship and their diamond collection, which is what we have here and what we were also drinking on the After Dark. They have the perfect wines to celebrate both big and small occasions all throughout the holiday season. You might just want to stock up to take you through November and December and then even New Year's, all the different little parties you're going to be going to and you need to just grab a bottle of wine, go grab a whole bunch of Francis Coppola's wine. The diamond collection is so good. Um, everybody will enjoy it if you bring it to the party. Coppola Claret Cabernet Sauvignon is the perfect pairing with all holiday meals. And Coppola Diamond Prosecco, that one's my personal favorite lately. It goes great with friends and family at your next holiday party. Francis Ford Coppola Winery, of course, will also be the official wine of the Charles Schwab Challenge at Colonial Country Club in May of 2024, which is a super fun golf tournament that, Em, I know you go to, and I always want to go to. I'll have to figure it out this year. We're and making it happen this year. We'll make it happen. We're making it happen this year. Uh, well, yeah, now that Kelly's job is different, yeah. life is just easier to schedule. Um, and they will, once again, support the Do It For Dirt Foundation, along with Emily and all of the wonderful, wonderful people over there. Basically, uh, the people at Francis Coppola are wonderful, and when we tell them that we have a cause that is important to us, they jump at the chance to help. 
and the wine is really good too. So what's not to like? Francis Ford Coppola Winery, Geyserville, Sonoma County, California. Please drink responsibly. Please drink responsibly. And just so you know, if you were thinking like, wait, what, what, what happened to Noble Vines? Noble Vines and Coppola are like their brother and sister. Mm -hmm. They're all, we're all one big happy, happy family. So, um, you know, we gave so much love to Noble Vines. We're like, oh, you guys, Noble Vines is doing great because of you. No, they didn't say that. <laughs> but let's let's give some love um, to to, uh, to to Big Brother here. So uh, we're thrilled to have Coppola on board. We're also thrilled to have um, Charlotte Jones on our show today. And I've been wanting to have Charlotte on forever. Um, she's such a stud in in the, the the sports space. She's a female, totally killing it, mom. Um, it comes from obviously an interesting family. In yeah. The, the Jones family associated with the Cowboys. Anything with the Cowboys is going to be huge, and Charlotte is an absolute stud, and uh, it's super exciting She's for us. Awesome. And when you think about, you know, Thanksgiving, you think about Cowboys football uh, and those halftime shows and the, the whole story behind the halftime shows and how they came to be and how they benefit the Salvation Army and what they've done for the Salvation Army is a story you will absolutely want to hear. Yep. Uh, we were honored to have Charlotte on our show this week, and why don't you just go have a listen to it now? Here she is. We are so excited now here on The Mom Game to welcome in Charlotte Jones. Charlotte, of course, the executive vice president of the Dallas Cowboys, a very busy woman, um, a very popular woman, and we are so thankful that you made some time for us today here on the show. Thank you, Charlotte. Well, I am so excited to be with you guys. And Emily, oh my, we cannot start without saying congratulations. <laughs> I, I feel like you bear the weight of the entire Ranger, Rangers franchise on your shoulder for decades. And for this to come to fruition like it did and in the way that it did, and after so many years of angst and waiting, I just, especially to you, congratulations. And obviously to all Ranger fans out there, um, what an amazing ride. Thank you for taking us on the journey, and we couldn't be more proud Aww. of our Texas Rangers. Wow, Charlotte, you're so sweet. Um, I appreciate those words. And, you know, we've known each other for a while. When we have guests on, um, we always like to talk about kind of how we got to know someone or how we m connected with them. And you and I both have a very good mutual friend in Meredith Land. Um, so we've been at, at luncheon tables a couple of times together. Um, I think I've supplied you with some lash boost, um, you know, <laughs> on occasion. Um, uh, yes, but I, that's the important step. <laughs> but I have always wanted to have you on um, because I think you're a, a fascinating figure. Um, I love what you do. than just kind of what's what's in the, the headlines, so to speak. So uh, I'm thrilled that you're here with us. We're going to try to, you know, be respectful of your time, but there are tons that we want to get into with you. <laughs> well, Emily, thank you for saying that. I am actually a little concerned about what your preconceived <laughs> notion <laughs> well, was I mean, of me maybe before. Yeah. No, I mean, and maybe we can like discuss that over a drink yeah, sometime. Yeah, yeah, not. But just like that, you would be like this, you know, hoity-toity, <laughs> fancy. You know, she's so big, like just intimidating. Yeah, 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 that's a great way to put it. And I, I don't know. I just was like, I just, it was so. Uh, and maybe I shouldn't have admitted that, but I just was like, man, she's got a lot. She's got her. <laughs> she's got her hey, we're very real here yeah. on the show, Charlotte. Um, 
But I mean, I was like, she's got her shit together and she knows what she's doing. And she, I mean, she's doing stuff all the time and like really important, big stuff. And I just think it's, it's important for, you know, for women to be in those positions, the positions that you're in, uh, and, and like, and, and make waves. And I, I am proud of of the work that you've done and continue to do. And we're going to talk some about that, but um, I just, I, I'm excited that you're on here so we can see, and hopefully our audience can see maybe a different side of you that they haven't seen. Great. Great. Well, thank you. <laughs> Privileged to be on. I'm excited to chat with you. So Charlotte, I know it's a big month for you. Um, obviously in the middle of a football season, the Cowboys with a really good season going right now at six and three and the Thanksgiving day game coming up very soon here. And that's kind of like your your baby, isn't it? Can you maybe just take us through how you got this whole Thanksgiving day game halftime show thing started and where it's at now and how much you're looking forward to this season? Yeah, you know, this, it is is an exciting time for us. It is every year and we are are fortunate to have the privilege to get to play on Thanksgiving. And that is thanks to Tech Shram way back when, when actually no one else in the NFL would agree to play on Thanksgiving. They said, it's too hard to sell tickets. People won't come. And he agreed to do it only if it became a tradition and that we would have it every year. And now I I don't know about you, but I can't imagine Thanksgiving without football, without Cowboys football. And so when we came along, um, you know, this actually started this whole tradition of launching and partnering with the Salvation Army and launching the National Red Kettle campaign um, came about about 27 years ago. So Roll that back. And, you know, Emily, unlike you and the Rangers, that's the last time we had won um, a world championship. So in the early 90s, you know, things were really great for us. And we had won two out of three Super Bowls. Everything was like on a high. are interested in us on the field, then we need to do something with that interest. We need to take what is here, what is this mess, and somehow we've got to turn it around. And sometime, somehow we need to partner with someone that is truly making a difference. And he said, we need to be the Jerry Lewis of something. And he said, now, it can't just be any, anybody. You know, it's, it has to be an organization that can truly stand up to the visibility that we would bring to it. And it had to be an organization that was based on integrity, because if we were going to bring in all of these eyeballs to it, uh, that was definitely going to be under scrutiny. And it also had to be a brand that was as big, if not bigger than ours. And so, you know, how did you go about finding it? So he said, okay, now there you go. And, you know, for me, you know, I was, I was 26. So I was like, oh boy, okay. What does that actually look like? A few weeks later, I found myself in the offices of Frito-Lay for another charitable meeting, board meeting that my father was unable to attend. And at the time, Steve Reinemann was the head of Frito-Lay. And as the meeting was going on, he slid me a note and said, I need to meet with you in my office after this meeting. And so all through the meeting, I was like, oh my gosh, why does Steve Reinemann need to meet with me? Because they didn't own a suite. They weren't season ticket holders. They were not a partner of ours. So I had no idea, you know, what this was about. And I thought, oh, this could actually be a really cool opportunity. So the meeting was over. Up we went to his office. And as I went in there, you know, I sat on his couch and he said, Charlotte, do you know what the largest service service organization in the world is? And I said, no, sir. And he said, do you know what organization helps more children than any other in the world? And I said, no, sir. And all I could think is like, okay, third strike. And I am so out of this office. I don't know what to do. And then he said, he goes, you see, he said, that's the problem. The Salvation Army is the largest service service organization in our country. And their humility does not allow them to get recognized for that. And he said, do you know anything about the Salvation Army? And all I said was, 
it's a place where we take our old clothes. And he just was, you know, confused by that statement. But at the same time, he realized this is what we need to do. We need to tell people more about what the Salvation Army does and its impact on community. And he said, I think you can help. And so we sat on this couch and I said, well, you know what? The only thing that I can think of is I know every year we have Thanksgiving Day. And that's the day when people open their hearts, they open their minds, they want to give, they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. How can we take that energy and that emotion in the middle of a game and launch the na a national red kettle campaign? Because those red kettles that you see out all over the country, it is the oldest and longest running campaign in our history. It's over 150 years old, the red kettle campaign. It's like if we could create a big launch around that, then maybe we could create more visibility and awareness and more people would give and that would help solve a lot of problems. So he said, great, that's a wonderful idea. I don't know how to do it. So I left that office and I went home and I was like, this is our big idea. This is our Jerry Lewis. This is our, this is our thought. And so I walked into our office and I was running back to see my dad and my boss stopped me in the hall and he's like, where have you been? And I said, oh, I was in the offices of Frito-Lay. And he said, really? did you sell them any tickets? And I said, oh, no, I didn't sell them any tickets. And he said, well, did you sell them a sponsorship? And I said, no, no, sir, I didn't sell them a sponsorship. And he said, well, then what did you do? And I said, I gave away our halftime show. <laughs> and he was like, oh, my gosh, he's screaming and yelling at me. And I'm, I just kept running back to my dad. I'm like, okay, I've got this really big idea. This is what I need. But I need you to get me a meeting with the president of NBC Sports in New York. And my dad looked at me and goes, oh, you want a meeting with the president of NBC Sports in New York? And I said, yes, we need to get this on television. And he kind of laughed a little bit and he said, you know what, I'll help you get your meeting. In between the time of that meeting, I went to see Reba McIntyre in Nashville. And I thought she would be the most amazing artist to be able to launch this. So I flew up to Nashville, I told her about this story. I told her about the Salvation Army. And I said, could you just do this for us? you know, for free, would you come be a performer at halftime? And she said, you know, the Salvation Army used to serve donuts on the front line of the war with my grandfather. I'll do anything to help you. Aww. And it was their, her grandparents' charity. And so we wrote a song. She had somebody write the song. We actually, we filmed the song. We got it on video. We got it on a cassette. And off I flew to New York City with my little boom box and my little cassette tape to go talk to NBC. And the night before we got there, I've got all my stuff spread out all over the floor and my boom box is going, my notes are on the floor and I'm trying to figure out about the meeting the next day. And my dad walks in and he goes, oh my gosh, that's such a mess, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm just preparing for the meeting tomorrow. And he goes, you know, I'll handle the meeting for you, don't worry. And so, oh, I, all right, okay. So we start off the next morning, we're walking down Fifth Avenue and you know, there it is. 30 Rock, it's like coming out of the asphalt all the way up to the sky, get on the elevator, go to the top floor, walk into Dick Ebersall's office. And we're sitting there exchanging pleasantries. And then he looks at me and he looks at my dad and he goes, why are you here? And my dad said, Charlotte has something she'd like to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> totally Pass the baton back to you. Lap, and I was like, okay. And so then I went on and told him the story about the Salvation Army. And I said, I want you to air this show at halftime. And he stopped me and he said, Charlotte, no one has ever walked into my office and asked me for airtime for free before. And I just sat there and, and he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you can go down to the league office and get an extension on halftime so I can still run my commercials, I'll give you the halftime and I'll air your show and I'll talk about the Salvation Army. But if it's not good, I'll cut straight to commercial. Oh, wow. So I looked at him and I his hand and I like walked out of the door and as soon as the door shut my dad grabbed my arm and he goes oh my gosh do you know what you just got and I was like my first nationally televised halftime show and he said no you just got 15 million dollars worth of exposure for the Salvation Army he said do you know what you're doing and I looked at him and I'm like no but I will by Thanksgiving I promise and then, <laughs> and then off we and sure enough, we launched the show with Reba McIntyre. It was amazing. Now here we are 27 years later, and that national launch has raised over three and a half billion dollars for the Salvation Army wow. right here at Thanksgiving Day. 
Wow. And can you, I mean, do you sit back sometimes? I mean, telling that story, I've never heard that story told, um, especially not by the person who's directly involved in it. Do you, do you, is that kind of a pinch me moment for you when you're 26 years old and, and you know, your dad empowers you like, like that to say, oh, you're questioning why my daughter's here. I'm going to show you why she's here and she's going to show you too. You know, when you look back on those moments, are you like, that was a, a pivotal moment, not only in my, my career, but also too in my, my personal life? You know, uh, there a lot. There's there's so much there for me because it was such a naive time. And you know, when you're so young, naivety is a great thing. When you're not even truly sure what you're actually asking somebody to give you, I, I think that is there's a lot of power in that. Um, but also, I am so blessed that my father. I, I grew up with two boys. Um, my father never saw gender at our dinner table ever. And he always believed that I could be president of the United States if I wanted to be. And he would tell me that every day. And he always had more confidence in me than I think I ever actually had in myself. So sometimes when I think back to that moment and I realize that I don't know if I would have been able to, would I've taken the same leap myself with such energy had he not been there to go, you're going and you're going now and you're going right into this fire and I am right here to catch you if you fall. And I think there's, um, you know, th that is such a pivotal moment for, for me, but has actually continued through my career. And I, I feel like now in the midst of, you know, to have something like this um, become a tradition that was really rooted in challenge. It was a really dark, messy time for our franchise um, with all this off field chaos and it was like how do you how do you take that chaos and that negativity and make it something really special and i think it really kind of set me up for now i feel like and my father said this often is like i think you do your best work in conflict and in chaos because you're not afraid of it and you always know okay you know there's a pony in here somewhere you know you got to go through all this mess manure if there's so much manure everywhere, maybe there's a pony down here somewhere. And so, you know, you got to find the pony. And for me, that has, has been a lot of my career, but it's really been rooted in the support that I got from, from both of my parents. So are you in charge, Charlotte, of like of the booking of the halftime performer? Is that kind of like that has to be so fun uh, to find somebody so that fun. that you probably get excited about that. The, you, but it has to be like somebody that's widespread enough that the giant audience watching the game will be excited about what's that, I guess, courting process and booking process like. And then I have to ask you about Dolly Parton because I am so pumped up for this year. <laughs> Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, so much. And, and yes, and it's, it's such an incredible process. And what I've learned through the years is actually how in entertainers actually view this. And, and as you can imagine, when you go just to the stadium alone and you have 85,000 people, not everybody listens to the same radio station. Not everybody has the same music in their, their iPhone. You know, yeah. it is, everyone is very eclectic, you know, in, in terms of what our audience actually prefers and with musical performances. So finding somebody that, that actually can entertain the whole, um, it's, it's not just nerve wracking for us selecting it. It's actually nerve wracking for the audience coming to perform because they're not doing a concert to their fans who have bought tickets. They're doing a show to all these people that it may not have even ever attended a show or downloaded one of their songs or any of that. So it's a little bit of a risk on, on both sides. So, you know, kind of respecting that from an artist standpoint, I think is, is really important. I'll never forget that when Kenny Chesney came to do it, he was like, you know, I'm really nervous about this. He goes, he goes, this is why people and artists are, are, you know, have, why you have such a challenge here is that's a lot of times the first thing that goes through their mind is these are not my fans. So how am I going to make sure that my performance um, suits them? N needless to say, the 45, 50 million people that are actually watching on, on TV. And this is, you know, this is only ever done. You know, the Super Bowl obviously is the biggest halftime show. Um, we have slowly raised, you know, you know, through the years, um, we have risen to be something incredibly noteworthy for artists to want to come to do mm -hmm. to get that exposure. So that has helped us, you know, through the years as we built that reputation. 
that finding, you know, the perfect artist, you're always wanting somebody that is e either completely nostalgic and amazing or really, really re relevant for the moment. Um, you know, I'll, one, one of our greatest artists that was actually back at Texas Stadium was the Jonas Brothers because I, years and years and years ago when they first came on the scene, they were, they were on this like hot just storm across the country and all of this young audience came and was so excited about having them there that it actually in hindsight, it was such a really great move on our part to really be able to, you know, it, in, in filter these young, young minds of like, okay, come on out here, enjoy the football game and enjoy this great music. And, and many tuned in just to see them, which was great. And now here we are fast forward with maybe one of the greatest icons in music of all time, my shero, you know, <laughs> Dolly Parton. I wanted Dolly to come do the show since I can remember. And it just was, you know, she was, she always had a lot on her plate. She didn't actually need any exposure. So that was not going against us. But for the last several years, I had asked and I'd asked and I'd asked. And then finally this year, I don't know if you guys remember, but the ACMs were out here at the Star. Yeah. And she and Brooks were the hosts of, of the ACMs. So her team was here and they approached our team and said, by any chance is that is that halftime show? Are y'all still doing that? Is it still available? No way. <laughs> and oh my God, you know, it's like, talk about stars aligning. She's releasing a rock album. Oh, wow. You know, I, I think it would be the Super Bowl halftime because she has this rock album with all of the old classic rock songs from, from Queen to Paul McCartney. She's got one with Miley Cyrus. I mean, they're the most amazing songs that she's taken their songs and done them with them and redone them. So we're, we're going to get a, a great blend. Of, okay. So of she'll be doing some of that. Few, few, few new ones or yeah. oldies that she has, she has remade. So um, it just happened to work out, you know, where she, she was wanting to launch this, her album comes out. We actually just launched it for sale. She has a special cowboy version of it, which is great. That's already sold out. It, it like hit online for a half a second, literally. And I think it sold out in an hour yesterday. So we're, we're trying to regroup and like go for that full force. But she's just going to bring all of her sparkle, glamour and excitement to the stage on Thanksgiving. We can't wait. Yeah. And she's just so cool. Like she's <laughs> like, I mean, she's like one of the coolest people on the planet. Like she's kind and she's talented and she's beautiful and she's yeah. legendary. I mean, she is. Talk about the total package. Um, Dolly Parton is the total yeah. package. Um, there, you have so much going on. Uh, I want to like talk a little bit about you know being a mom um, right fast because how how have you managed to balance everything? I mean, you're talking about you know from the time you're a young girl um, or you know young professional out of Sanford, um, you know getting the opportunity to work for this team, but also too. Uh, like you said, wanting to buck maybe those preconceived notions that some people had that, oh, you're, you know, you're just the, the owner's daughter and, and you, you pull a paycheck. I mean, you're doing shit. Like a lot of it. Um, how do you continue to, you know, to, to handle that, to balance that? How do you raise them, you know, being in uh, from a, a very well-known family and under that scrutiny that you talk about the Cowboys are under, that applies to you guys as a family as well. You know, I, I tell you what, that, that balance word, you know, I just, I don't actually like it <laughs> because uh, I, I can't actually say that I have ever found balance um, with anything. I, everything is a little bit Im imbalanced. And, and I, you know, I've always been a believer that you can have it all. You just can't have it all at once. And it is like, how, how do you let that pendulum swing from one side to the other and be able to look in the mirror because I do think that we are our own worst critic about balance of, you know, how do we not feel guilty about the time spent with our family versus the time spent at work? And every day is a different day. If, if you're like me, some days you wake up and everything is great. You're, you know, your kids are smiling and they're happy. And then other, other days you feel like you've totally neglected them. Um, but things at work are, are just going crazy and, and going in your favor even, or even when they're not. And I, I think that's, you know, 
that's such a, a, a difficult challenge. And I, I feel like we we hurt our own selves in that regard. I think as 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 a mom group and a peer group, we need to be lifting each other up about um, our imperfections, or I should say, our perceived imperfections, because. I look at my kids now who are grown. I am an empty nester. My youngest is actually a senior playing football at the University of Texas. Look him. He's awesome. But what I look back at them and they are, they are the judge of how we were as a mom. And my kids were always incredibly supportive of, of my work. They happen to love it. Um, my son actually gets the credit for naming the star out here. I remember coming home after me days and days and weeks and weeks of beatings of trying to find the perfect name for this. And he was 11 and he looked at me and he said, why are you so complicated? Why can't you just call it a star? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, it was like, oh, you know, I don't know. Why am I so complicated? You know, it's like, and all of a sudden, you know, there we go. And they, you know, they all had their moments throughout my career and their young lives um, of, you know, days that were bad. I remember that same son being, you know, but by the way, I started when there were no computers and there were no cell phones. So it was a very different age back then. And then all of a sudden we got the computer, which means we could not only just work at work, we could then work at home, which is a whole nother drama. And I remember my son at home when I was working one night and he crawled under my desk and he pulled the cord out of the computer. Like oh, pulling out the wall. Like, he was trying to send you a message. Me, me. What about me? And so I have my moments of of being, you know, sad and feeling like I'm I'm not giving the time that I need to give here. Um, but then I also had the moments from them that said, "Oh my gosh, you know, it's okay that the toast is burnt every morning. I wouldn't know what to do if it wasn't." You know, it's like <laughs> they're, 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 they love that. They love the the career and the su success that I've had. They love being a part of that. So, you know, I I think all of that balance and justification, you know, really has to come internally, you know, from inside and how we judge ourselves. But most importantly, it's about the quality of time. You, you spend with your family, not necessarily quantity. And I, I think we all need to, to go a little easier on ourselves, all us working moms. Um, and, and more like, like, you know, really wonder woman, she's, she's got, she's got holes in her cape or at least mine does. And it's like, yeah. sometimes we fall, we get back up and then sometimes we knock it out of the park. That's really good advice uh, about quality instead of quantity, because that's something that Emily and I talk about a lot here on the show. Um, and then just being in the situation you are where you're immersed in an NFL team, you know, Emily gets to experience that some with her job and bringing her kids to the games. My husband was a coach on the star staff for 14 years. So we brought kids to the games. Like how fun has that been for you just as a mom and as part of the family? Like when you go to work, they're at a Cowboys game. <laughs> like that just has to be such a fun, I guess, memory all through their childhood into their adulthood. Something that's helped just keep the whole family together too. You know, I know. And, and you know, full disclosure it really helps when you can uh, when your work is take take your son to work day and it happens to be a football game so it's like <laughs> all of that is all of that is really great and they have been you know really you know entrenched in every aspect of that and and it's and it's super personal to them I, I will say there's there's also a little bit of of you know challenge that comes with that you know unfortunately when the kids go into the classroom and you haven't had a really good Sunday um, you know, other kids let them know about it and they have to deal with that and they have to, you know, stand strong in the, in the hallway of, of people getting, uh, other kids getting frustrated, people getting frustrated that the games didn't go the way they wanted them to go. So there's, there's certainly the, the upside and then there's certainly the challenge, but um, I, I think they've, they've been superstars in, in terms of, of going through all of this. Now they remind me every day that um, my youngest one was not around when we won a championship. Um, I was pregnant with my first child when we won our first ch championship. And then I had two of them present at the third one, but they don't remember it. So it's like, <laughs> okay, now we're here. We've endured it. Now, where is it? So <laughs> <laughs> they're ready. They are ready. We've they're ever ready. Talked to they're ready. ready. We talked about your dad, but I'm I'm curious to hear about your mom. 
um, and, and what yeah. that relationship is like between the two of you. Um, and kind of, you know, we don't see a ton from her. It, 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 she's not out front a lot, um, but she seems to handle herself with just such grace and definitely her fingerprints as, um, you know, as your daddy's wife and as the mother of you guys that are all over this thing. What, what would you want people who don't know her um, to know about your mom? Well, I would say this, and, and my, my brothers would, would certainly echo and, and say this all the time. She is truly the glue to our family. Um, I don't know how many of you out there actually work in a family business, um, but they teach courses at Harvard and Stanford to not go into family business because it, <laughs> it is challenging. It's, it's, personalities are challenging when they become your family. It is, it is really challenging. Um, I don't think we could have done what we have done as a family had it not been for my mom. And I think she is is the one that like just creates the balance across all all of us um, and and the gratitude and the appreciation for for what we have and what we're able to accomplish. And early on, you know, she was completely engaged, you know, totally, you know, out there moving tables. I, you know, I remember our first event at, at St. Edwards when we just moved training camp back to or, or to Texas and we're trying to find, you know, ways to stop losing money and we're trying to have an event and a, and a luncheon and she's like moving the tablecloths and putting the arrangements on the table. You know, she's completely hands-on, you know, day one. I, I think we're, we're, my father's exuberance is about his passion for the game. Um, if I got passion from my father, I'd probably get some passion from my mother. And I think my mother is a constant reminder to all of us that to whom much is given, much is required. And that is in a philanthropic standpoint, it is in a corporate standpoint, it is how we carry ourselves you know, as, as a family and as individuals, and, and certainly how um, we have raised own children and how hopefully that is passed on to the next generation. So um, I probably don't know anybody um, as strong or stronger than my mother. Um, I, I, I think um, her ability to, to take the ride and the journey that we have had and to be able to, to bring us all to the table every day as our best self, um, he gets all the credit for Charlotte, um, obviously you've been following <laughs> and been a part of the Cowboys team for a long time, but when it comes to the football side of things, like I know that's not necessarily your day job, but how into it are you? Like, do you live and die with each game as a, as a fan or do you watch it more like a businesswoman or what's it like just watching a, watching a game with you? And, you know, this season's going pretty well. Everyone has to be pretty pumped. <laughs> So it's it's all of the above. I watch it as a fan. I watch it from a business. I, I watch it with an emotional attachment. I'm incredibly superstitious. Like all all the things. If the Sox are, are winning that day, they will be they're winning the next week the same ones. You know, it's like everything everything is is totally a part of of my life and of of our lives. And it's and I think. Um, you know, one of one of the things that's the most interesting thing I find about sports and in, in our our situation is that we never take for granted people's avidity um, to our game and how much they truly care about the game, how they care about the players, how they want to win, how you know we um, and Emily, I know you you feel this a lot. We we as as a sport are a respite for people that everybody has a lot going on in their lives and they're very challenged and, and things are, are difficult. Um, and they look to us to, to come together, to celebrate something um, unified as, as a mass of people that all come from incredibly different backgrounds and wherewithals. And here they are on any given Sunday and they are coming together to cheer for their favorite team. And in that creates this uh, responsibility to their emotion. And as, as you go through the game, you know, obviously you want the success, you want the player success and you want everything to, to go the way that you hopefully have planned it. Um, when you fall short of that, you know, you feel, of course, the disappointment for the players themselves who receive the most, you know, criticism for failure. Um, but you feel like you've let everybody down. 
And when you look at a mass of people who have all showed up to cheer you on and you can't quite get there and it's like, oh, how did we not do this for all these people that care so much? And so I think as much as it hurts personally, um, it hurts more to, to let others down that follow you consistently day after day and year after year and just want so much hope because you you see when you, you win how much exuberance it brings I mean there's less road rage people buy you <laughs> coffee at Starbucks it's like pay it forward like everything is amazing and then when you lose it's like oh it, you know it's just this heavy 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 weight and you know I think I think that's it and it's not like for a personal feeling it's it's truly is for for everybody else and i know our players feel that way and this day and age you know it is a roller coaster the highs are never higher but those lows they're they're pretty significant and you know it just is you know that's the journey of of our game and that's the beauty of our game and i i, I think that's that's why you know every, everybody loves it um, they love to love it. They love to hate it. They love to cheer for you. They love to cry for you. They love to yeah. scream at you. you know? <laughs> it's all of the emotion. And, you know, I wouldn't trade it for anything. The responsibility to the fans' emotions. I love that. And I'm totally stealing it because it's so true. And that hits the nail on the head, um, you know, for, for you guys as the Cowboys. I know I feel it. Um, you know, being that conduit from our organization to our fan base, you feel that, that you do have a responsibility to those fans' emotions because they are so terribly invested. That's a brilliant line. So thank you for that. I will be stealing it. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you too. I know, I know, I, but we don't want to. We want to be respectful of your time. Two more things, or one more thing for me, and then I know we want to ask about the salute to service nomination nomination because that is absolutely huge. Um, one thing I did want to ask you about, like the family dynamic between you. You've got two brothers. Uh, I mean, you guys have been people. People look at the that TV show Succession and they're like. That's like the Joneses. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like that crazy to think about like how those, like, I mean, obviously I hopefully aren't going to like try to kill each other or anything, but you know, just the, <laughs> the dynamic that, that's involved when you are such a high profile family there, you know, y'all are all involved in the family business. Like how, I mean, I can't, my kids are fighting over, you know, Legos. Like I didn't, what's it like to, for you guys as, as siblings and what do you want to do? in this in this thing that's what's so their funny. ultimate goal oh my gosh. that's that's so funny and it's so funny that you bring up those shows succession because i love that show first of all and i i happened to go to one of the premieres and at the premiere shiv was there okay so those of you familiar with the show session there's one daughter and her name is shiv and then she has her her three brothers so I went up to her and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm like such a fangirl, but I was trying to figure out what should I say. And so I couldn't really think of what to say. And all I did is I walked up to her and I went, oh my gosh, I play you in real life. <laughs> <laughs> I play you in real life. It's amazing. And she just looked at me and she goes, oh God, I hope not. You know, and she's like, and then we just started this great conversation. We had a great laugh and she was, is truly amazing. Um, and such a big fan of hers, but anyway, I, you know, our, my brothers and I, we, we laugh about that a lot. You know, it is, you do, um, you know, there's one thing about family you don't, and this is probably maybe the not so good thing about family is you, you don't really hold your tongue you know, yep. out of, out of respect, you just kind of let things fly. So you know, when you let things fly, you know, then they can go kind of all over the place. Um, but what, what is really, really great about us and, and my brothers is that we are three really distinctively different people and we think differently. Um, there, there are things that each of us excel in that the other doesn't. And we recognize that in each other. And I, I actually think it is our secret sauce. I think it's what makes us better. You know, when you, when you talk about great leaders or great visionaries of, of companies, you know, you list different skill sets. I'm not sure if any of us have all of them, but across the three of us and then four and five with my parents, I feel like we cover everything. And I actually think that is really the beauty of the chemistry that, that makes us, um, that has helped us create the success that we have. And, you know, whether, whether we 
um, say enough to, to make the other one anxious or, or not, you know, if we're not poking each other, we're not getting better. And so I, I think as, as we see that, the greatest thing about that, we have the ability to do that. And then, but we all have the same end goal. And so we, we never leave a meeting without agreeing that the direction we've decided upon is the right one. So I, I, I give that, um, that ability to do that. I give all that credit to my mother of, okay, it's like, she's like lock in a room. You're not coming out till you all agree. You know, it's like, <laughs> this is, you know, that's what we used to do. It's like, okay, you know, nobody gets the toy until everybody's happy. You know, yeah. it's kind of one, one of those things that have, have proven to be um, an incredible tactic for us in life. Yeah. It's not like you want to be carrying around weight of some argument like forever. Right. <laughs> Especially in what y'all are doing day to day. Like, it's just on such a magnified level. Um, so I love hearing that. Water, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's like you got to work through stuff. Don't go to bed angry. That's what they say about your spouse, right? Uh, yeah. Same idea with your family. You know, you know, the, you know the, the saying about the cup of water. You know, mm-hmm. So you can hold a cup of water forever or not. You know, it's like, oh, it's just a little thing. It's just a little bit of water. And then you hold it and you hold it and you hold it. And all of a sudden it gets it gets too heavy and then it, and then it explodes. And yep. so it's like, we, we ever, we don't ever hold the cup of water. Right. We don't want it to explode. That's for sure. We all are doing a wonderful job of that. Emily referenced the salute to service award, um, that you were nominated for. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, sounds like you're doing, uh, the whole family is doing a ton of really good work with the national medal of honor museum. What all is going on That's with that? Your baby. Oh my gosh, so excited for this and so excited that it is right there in the heart of Arlington between Globe Life Park and AT&T Stadium. I mean, what an incredible honor for us us to actually get the opportunity to build it here. I mean, that was a whole big RFP selection process that Arlington won the bid for. Um, I am have the privilege of being able to chair that effort and we have done such amazing work so far to raise $240 million to build this museum, to house these incredible stories of the more than 3,500 Medal of Honor recipients. And these stories, it, you know, for those of you who don't know, the Medal of Honor is the highest award of, com- and of valor in combat that the president gives. And so um, it started back with Abraham Lincoln so only 3,500 plus recipients have actually received it. Their stories are simply amazing. They are truly unbelievable. But what I love the most about them is that they are stories of very common people choosing to do very uncommon feats. And they do it out of sacrifice and love of fellow man. They do it for the love of people they will never meet. They sacrifice their life. Think about that. They sacrifice their life for you. And they will never know who you are. And that is such a huge sacrifice. That's really what our country is built on, the democracy that our country is built on, that is so fragile. You know, I think about why hasn't this been done before? But you look around today about what we are as a country and a society and what's happening in our world. I think it was meant to be today. So we can bring people together, remind people about the importance of patriotism and sacrifice and courage, and do so in a way that not only honors these recipients, but also honors the 40 plus million men and women who have served and continue to serve in our armed forces. So it is just the most amazing project I've ever been on, um, been involved with. And we are so excited because we'll open in 2025 that of the spring of 2025. So, you know, when you come out to a Rangers game or you come out to a Cowboys game, you're going to pass it. And now you're going to know what it is. And then this will give you a chance to, to say thank you. Well, Charlotte, so cool. you have, I will, I know you, you, you're so busy. Um, it, this has been so much fun. Um, we, I could talk to you for another two hours. Um, so we'll have to do this again. And next time we'll get you in studio and we'll, we'll open some wine. Uh, yeah we're good at that and have some real fun uh, but this has been seriously thank you so much we wanted to have you on forever um I just am so impressed by you and I shame on me for having those preconceived notions that you would just be too fancy for me or for us or uh for anyone um but yeah you it, it's just fun to hear you talk I'm so proud of the work that you have done not that you need that from me but you're kicking ass girl and I think it's so so fun to watch yeah 
Yeah, and we're rooting for the Cowboys. We, I mean, I, I mean, I, we had season tickets for like a couple years when we were still at Texas Stadium. We lived in Plainview, and my dad, we would fly up a couple times a year to go to Cowboys games. I have loved this franchise, this organization, since I was a tiny little girl. It's how my daddy and I bonded when I was a little girl. So I would, like, no one would be, I mean, well, there would be people. Happy she wants you to win a Super Bowl I is what she's win saying. Super Bowl too. Let's go this year. <laughs> yes, we all do. <laughs> so let's go Thank you. Series, and let's get that Lombardi trophy here uh, yep. in Dallas. We are rooting for the Cowboys. And Charlotte, we are rooting for you. You are a delight. Let me know when you need some more lash boost. Yeah. <laughs> and for sure, for sure. Ladies, thank you so much for having me on. It's been a true pleasure. Thank okay. you. Okay, wait, Appreciate wait, wait, wait. it. One more thing, and this is you it, this is means you're not fancy. You gotta do the peace signs and say mom game out. It's how we end all of our shows on the count of three. Wait, wait, wait. Say, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What'd you, you say? Gotta throw up the peace sign. Double peace Double sign. signs. And say mom game out. That's what we do to close the show. Okay, ready? Ready? Okay. One, two, three. Mom game out. Okay. Mom, Mom game, game out. out.